Hello. Welcome, uh, dear Elizabeth Satoris, to the um, Config Transformation Online Summit, uh, coming down to earth. This is an online summit that aims to explore pathways towards regenerative cultures in a divided world. And I'm really, really thrilled to have you here today. You are internationally known as a dynamic speaker. You are an evolution biologist, a futurist, who also looks in the deep past to understand better where we might be heading towards. You've been a professor, an author, and consultant on living systems design. Welcome, dear. Really, really welcome. And yeah, could you tell us a bit about your your journey? How you started? How, what made you uh, start this path uh, in biology and then evolution biology, and and maybe from there we can move forward. Thank you, Nunu. It's delightful to be here with you, with you in East Timor and me in Hawaii, and we are all thinking globally these days, or globally, both globally and locally at one time, uh, to face our big challenges. I was very lucky to be a child uh, born before World War II, and uh, back then there were no agricultural chemicals yet. My food was entirely organic, even though nobody had that word yet for it. And uh, so I was, I was, uh, my body was formed from the natural uh, materials of the earth in my river valley where I grew up. And I was also allowed to run freely in, in uh, nature as a child, which is very difficult for parents to allow children to do this anymore. Uh, but we were often just all day out uh, playing with fixing up old boats to, to go out onto the river or in the winter walking on the ice and communing with the trees and the animals. And uh, I never thought anything about nature was dangerous. We, we walked across slippery logs over waterfalls and we never got hurt. You know, it was, uh, it was wonderful because in that childhood, uh, I learned things like uh, climbing trees you can see far and walking on thin ice. Uh, you have to be very careful and crossing fences that say no trespassing means maybe you have to break some rules. So those were good lessons from childhood about the situation we're in now where we have to see far and walk on thin ice carefully and try to figure out uh, which fences we must cross in order to make a better world. So I was naturally drawn to biology as a study. And because of the time I was born, uh, as a girl, my parents didn't let me study science first. Uh, so I, I was sent to study art. <laughs> and then only after that, that I had my degree in art could I, and I was on my own, I could go back to university and end up getting a PhD in evolution biology which I call being a deep pastist, as you said, in order to be a good futurist. That's awesome. I relate a lot with that and often comment with friends how we were lucky to, to grow up in a time we could play freely and um, yeah, in, in deep contact with nature. So I'm, I'm, you got me really curious. Could you tell us a bit about in your, in your studies, your research, what have you came across looking at, you know, the deep history of life in the planet that could help us understand a bit better where we are at as a species and in this particular moment in history? I think that would be really, really helpful. Yes. While I'm thinking about my life journey, let me mention that I had a kind of midlife crisis in my early 40s. Uh, where the science I was taught seemed to, was feeling like a straitjacket. There was something wrong. I was taught a cosmology about a big bang uh, that was uh, like a point explosion. And then uh, that explosion powered everything up to now, uh, like a kind of big battery uh, that runs down. So the worldview was that the energy is getting weaker and weaker through entropy 
and eventually this universe will die. And I said, you know, there's something wrong with this linear universe that's all going downhill. And then the biology I was taught was all about Darwin's competition. And so, uh, so basically the message that the scientists were teaching us were that the universe is running down and, and, and life is an endless struggle in scarcity against that tide that will eventually wash us all away. And I said, no, something wrong. This is the gloomiest worldview I, I can imagine. <laughs> and surely things aren't that bad. So I went off to live on a Greek island, and I was going to write novels. I was going to give up on science and to write novels to explain the human condition to myself. I had become very interested in things like economics and politics, uh, and I was protesting a lot uh, against, uh, you know, for clean air or against people being thrown out of their houses uh, because they couldn't afford them. And whatever it was, there were big already economic problems in the 1970s. And of course, we'd been through the 60s where we learned to, how to protest pretty effectively. And so anyway, there I was on a Greek island and uh, I, I wrote such novels for a while and burned most of them afterwards. And finally, one day was walking in the forest and a uh, and a an walking stick insect fell on my sleeve and I burst into tears remembering them from my childhood. These look like little sticks with long, almost invisible legs on them. Like an old friend had come to say, no, you still must be a scientist. And so I decided to look again at evolution and at paraphysics and see, is there not a more positive worldview that uh, we can come to? And I did that and I wrote to scientists around the world and they sent me books and they sent me papers because there was no library on my little island, you know. And eventually I put together a whole new story that was much more positive. And when I came back, I was interviewed for a book that was published in the year 2000. I was gone for 13 or 14 years. And this book, well, let me put, see if, we can make it show, is called The Cultural Creatives. And in it, after they interviewed me, they called my trip to Greece, my many years in Greece, a shamanic journey. And I thought, that's a strange way, because I wasn't thinking of my own transformation so much as the world, the cosmos, the biology, the you know future. Uh, but I didn't think of myself going through a transition as an individual. And I, I, I kind of balked at their calling them that. And then I realized that what I had done in going there was I stripped myself of my identity because I was on a little island where nobody spoke English. So I had to struggle to become communicative. So I stripped myself of language. I couldn't explain to anyone what a PhD is. Uh, I had no no credential, <laughs> right? I was reduced back to infancy in a way and had to start all over to become enough of a storyteller to tell stories in very simple ways to people. So I understand that is the idea of the shamanic journey, right? You go into the depths of yourself and you recreate yourself from scratch. You have to go through an initiation something like that. And so many people discover only after they go through these things that they did go through such transformations. That's, that's lovely. And I was thinking like how, yeah, how every time we, we spend time living in somewhere different, we have that sense of identity being shaken and then there's an opportunity to really enlarge it. Um, so could you could you tell us a bit like what in this shift I've got really there, there's two things that that are really interesting for me. One is what you said about uh, the the narratives, the worldviews that are dominant in academia these days uh, in that time, and I think still up to these days in in most places is still dominated by perspectives that that are. Uh, limiting our possibilities.
capabilities of seeing differently and of, of investigating different possible different areas. So you mentioned the linear perspective of, of cosmos, which has changed in the last decades in, in many parts of academia, but it's still told in schools, most parts of the world in that way. You mentioned Darwinism and this perspective of life as struggle and, and scarcity. So I'm really curious, what, what did you discover when you start that path towards, um, towards a different way of seeing? Yes, well, it's very interesting. I, I took a lot of walks and I spent a lot of time on a fishing boat, a kaiki. Uh, it took sometimes days for the waves to rock away my crazy thoughts and, <laughs> and be able to reflect more deeply. And, uh, and I ran into the work of uh, Jim Lovelock and Lynn Margulis. Uh, Jim Lovelock, who, James Lovelock, who gave us the Gaia hypothesis of a living Earth. And of course, and then I discovered how many cultures had already seen the Earth as alive long ago, but it was Western science when it became a purely materialist kind of uh, science that took that away from us. And uh, um, I'm going to mute for a minute. It's okay, Elizabeth. It's part of the of the drill of, uh, okay. of life, of everyday life. <laughs> All right. It's because uh, there's a, a firehouse near where I'm living here in the city, <laughs> and uh, the ambulances and the rescue uh, vehicles come by fairly often during the day. Um, yes. well, anyway. We welcome you fully in your place, so it's fine. <laughs> yes, that's part of location, yes. Yeah. Right. Uh, so anyway, I, uh, in, in working on the Gaia hypothesis and being very interested in the microbial world that Lynn Margulis showed us how, uh, how the most ancient bacteria that had the earth to themselves for fully half of evolution went through a very long phase of competition before they became cooperative. And so I saw that this here they here were these tiny little bacteria, but they so coated the earth, they were so prolific that they were able to change the whole climate and they ate up all the free food, the sugars and acids that had formed naturally on the planet's surface. So they created first a hunger crisis and a global hunger crisis, and they solved it by evolving themselves to be able to make food from what was left, sunlight and minerals uh, and water, which uh, the invention was photosynthesis. So the first bacteria were just fermenting the free sugars and acids. Then we had photosynthesis where creatures could actually make food out of almost nothing, desert-like conditions. And then those bacteria that were doing the photosynthesis uh, they were, were uh, giving off a, a waste gas called oxygen, which was kind of toxic to all the other bacteria. And so the, some of them had to go underground. The fermenters became bubblers in the, in the swamps and things, you know, to hide from this crazy oxygen. So they formed, so they did not only global hunger, but then global pollution. And without benefit of brain, these ancient bacteria actually solved both of those problems. And I went into that detail because we are the first creatures of Earth since those first bacteria repeating that kind of situation where we cause global hunger and global pollution, uh, which is kind of weird. No other, no other creatures in between them and us have done it. Furthermore, when we look at what happened with the bacteria, when they became cooperative, they did so as very big communities that we know of as nucleated cells, where the different kinds of bacteria cooperated together within a cell wall, and they all gave up some of their DNA to a central library we call the nucleus. And so there were now two kinds of cells on the planet. There were the bacteria, and the nucleated cells, which we call protists. And so uh, they went through 
again, all these hostilities of competition, like Darwinian competition, right? Again, like their ancestors, the bacteria had, until finally, after a billion years of that, they formed multi-celled creatures as their cooperatives. So, hmm, I said, here's a pattern. The bacteria are, are go through a long phase in which they're very competitive and then become cooperative. The new cell, new on the planet, goes through a long phase of competition before it becomes cooperative. And now we, who are multi-celled creatures, humans, the rest of evolution in between, you learned in school, you know, about the, the creatures coming out of the sea onto land and the plants of flowering, the plants and animals, the fungi, all that you know about in evolution, but you were not probably taught this first three quarters of evolution, three billion years out of four, uh, in which the single-celled creatures did all of these things that we are repeating now. So I came to see this as a cycle of evolution, a maturation cycle, where species have to go through a juvenile or youthful phase before they can morph into mature cooperative beings. And in between the transition phase, which we call adolescence, uh, as you know, we have the dependent childhood phase, and then we move into the independence the fierce independence, which is adolescence. And then we come back into community where family and larger community and even global community start to matter. And we see the advantages of cooperation. So the most important thing I learned is it is cheaper, meaning more energy efficient in biology to feed your enemies than to kill them. That is the big lesson, and that is the lesson we are now learning, that we too can save a lot of money and energy if we make friends of our enemies and all work together for a better world. It's interesting you say that, the, that for instance, in the States, it's more expensive for the government to have someone incarcerated in prison than to put him in studying in, in one of the major colleges. So it's really striking what you say. It's actually happening. So, and you can see that those signs in, in different places. So I, I wonder, like, if we shift our, our perspective to the current times, what do you see, like, as signs of that, that we are in that moment of, of transition? Mm -hmm. In, and like maybe you can point the finger at some things that is making us stuck and in this yeah. kind of energy deficit. Uh, and so, yeah, and from there we can maybe talk a bit about what, what signs are already here also of, of right. shift moving forward. Yeah, well, you know, in biology, in that in-between time from the formation of the nucleated cell to us uh, as, as multi-celled creatures, um, you see a number of global crises we call extinctions, where most of the plant and animal life was wiped out. Uh, and it, these were enormous crises, right? And the crises were always solved by new cooperatives <laughs> so that the ecosystems that weren't functioning anymore in the crisis had to kind of fall apart before the new species could evolve and, and take care of the problems and find new ways to develop themselves together cooperatively as ecosystems. And all our ecosystems, whether they are prairies or rainforests or whatever, are highly, highly cooperative. And so what we're seeing now is the breakdown of a major civilization, the current uh, human civilization, which originated in the West on an economic basis uh, of it's, well, it's the last phase in what I call the empire building phase for humans, <laughs> you know. Uh, humanity first, as we all know, was tribal. We came out of trees. We uh, started making tools. Uh, we invented tools for hunting and fishing that gave us high quality protein that exploded our brains. And then we formed all kinds of societies from small family and clan groups up to tribal. And eventually we started to build cities. 
And it's very interesting to, when you look at a city from the air, from an airplane, it looks just like an amoeba, a single celled creature on a, on a slide. And you see here, my city behind me, where the nucleus, the big city hub, has these, these tentacles that reach out behind up into the green hills, into the food areas. So you see the, the transportation moving around in an amoeba, just like a city looking at it from the air. And so I see the cities humans have built as quite natural entities, whereon, whereupon I looked at nation states and they are completely artificial. We scratch lines on the ground right through cultures, making a mess of, of things culturally and putting people at odds with each other. Uh, and they are unnatural. So I believe that we, in the future, the cities will stay, but the nation states will probably fall apart. And we are seeing now that many mayors are collaborating all over the world, moving into the collaborative phase of humanity and ignoring the rules made by their federal governments, by their national governments. In the United States, we see this particularly with sanctuary cities, for instance, welcoming the immigrants that the federal government is trying to keep out <laughs> and, uh, and working on climate change, whether or not the, the, the national government agrees that there even is climate change, the cities are tackling the problem. So we're seeing this wonderful transition where, where things on the one hand are falling apart and on the other hand, that is allowing us to build in the cracks of the old that is falling apart. We used to think uh, somehow there would be a big crisis and everything would be gone and then we would rebuild afterwards something new. But now we see that the new sprouts among the old the way you see plants cracking concrete and growing up right through it. <laughs> yeah, it's it's interesting you say that because there's there's a lot of conversations around the other day I read an article about someone talking about the boring the boring revolution. So there's different understandings about the stage we are in, but I I'm I resonated a lot with what you say that the level, the, the the kind of shift we are talking about, which is really a, a deep conscience um, shift on a planetary scale, and uh, somehow needs needs to emerge from from deep crises. And it's like, and if we see in our lives, that's also how we we give sometimes quantum leaps in moments after overcoming moments of deep crises, either of deep losses or other mm -hmm. uh, unexpected things. And I'm thinking like so we have we have a very hot uh, subject these days that is the the COVID nineteen the corona, more known as the coronavirus who just emerged a few months ago in in China, um, and it's like it's very clearly becoming a, a global phenomenon, and in a way is really exposing much of the fragility of our super efficient systems. So perhaps we can also talk a bit about that because for me it's interesting. We've been talking about bacteria and now a virus is just like um, suddenly uh, contributing to this major shift. And could, yeah. could you share a bit like what you, what you have been thinking about that? Yes, well, one thing that's important that has happened in the last decade or so is that we have become much more aware of the, the bacteria that how we are housing, right, that are on our skins and in our guts, that we have about 50 trillion cells in our bodies, the nucleated cells that I talked about, but we also carry still those ancestral bacteria in our guts, and only in the past decades did we stop seeing all bacteria as hostile and, and be afraid of them. That we realized that 99 plus percent of them are running our immune systems, are keeping us healthy, are digesting our fleet food, are, are actually contributing to our brain hormones and things like that, so that we start to see them as friendly. Now, a virus is not viable on its own. A virus can only replicate itself when it's inside a living cell of the nucleated kind. So the virus is in a sense simpler 
Well, it, it definitely, it's simpler than a bacterium. The closest thing we know about are sperm, which are packages of DNA that have an electric motor attached to them. Those motors were invented by bacteria billions of years ago. And so the sperm can't do anything by itself. It has to enter into an egg cell in order to replicate. It's kind of like a fancy virus, right? <laughs> that can has as much DNA package as the cell, the nucleated cell itself has. Because I believe that the bacteria invented viruses as ways to protect whole packages of DNA through climate crises, uh, right? So that, that that virus can last for thousands of years. And then when the climate is benign again, and there's some creatures around, it can enter the creatures and replicate. So what is this new COVID virus? One of the things we know is that humans are playing around with viruses in laboratories. And, uh, and we know that some of these laboratories are in the US and some of them are in China and some of them are in uh, Iran or where, you know, there, there are a number of countries, Syria, we know that, that have developed bioweapons. Yeah. Now, these, there are two reasons for playing around with viruses in a laboratory. One is if you want to manufacture something virulent, right, a disease virus. The other is if you want to try to uh, develop vaccines and you have to alter the viruses and try out different vaccines and things like that. We have no way of knowing right now whether the, the COVID-19 virus is one that has escaped from such a lab or whether it is one that came directly from some animal to some human. Uh, the, the suspect in this case is bats. And, but we do know that the COVID-19 is directly related to both the SARS and the MERS and the HIV virus. All three of those have surface features on the COVID-19 virus, all three of them. And maybe that's why it is more virulent than the others have been. The best thing we can do to protect ourselves is A, don't let the fear wreck your immune system. You know, if your emotions are constantly in a state of anxiety, that is stressful to the body. And uh, the best thing you can do to protect yourself is do everything you can to boost your immune system. And that is not about uh, Western medicine. It is about natural vitamins and herbs and uh, staying away as much as possible from your electronics and having your teeth in good order without metals in your mouth. Uh, you know, there are lots of getting plenty of sleep, getting lots of pure water. Uh, all of these things that keep you healthy will make you resistant whatever the viruses that come your way are. And, and most viruses, again, are benign. It's very few of them, a tiny percentage that cause our diseases. So don't see all of these microbes as enemies. And I would not use any chemical wipes or sprays to control them because what those things do, those chemicals, is to select for the hardiest ones, for the worst ones. Yeah. They, ought, they encourage the evolution in the micro world to resist our antibiotics literally means anti-life drugs and now are antivirals as well. So uh, plain good old fashioned soap and water work. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I was, I was also thinking that's great, Elizabeth. And I was also thinking on, on, on in uh, also other aspects, like for instance, the, the news that uh, the emissions of uh, the carbon emissions in in the that central area of China have reduced dramatically in the last three months because of this. It's one of the interesting things that yes, came out. <laughs> uh, there's there's other things. One of them that I think is is something that we are going to have to grapple with to and to reflect as communities, particularly in cities, like we've been talking about, is that. Cities have been dependent on um, uh, linear 
uh, networks of uh, production and distribution that many of them are far away from the city. So, for instance, much of the food supplied to a city or a big part of it comes from far away or some, some essential parts of it and some other essential goods are also coming from far away. And because the, the, the because of the response we are seeing around towards the to, to try to uh, r- limit the pandemia, we start to see scarcity coming in supermarkets and different yeah. places because everybody runs to you know to buy food to have at home because of course we cannot survive without that. So I'm also curious how cities are going to be looking at this and start to think like well maybe the systems we have in place are not contributing for uh, our our resilience and anti fragility because we have, we've we have grown and um, increasingly becoming anti uh, fragile and having fragile systems. Yes, very much so. And uh, the, I think uh, some of the most encouraging things I've seen, uh, besides all the echo villages popping up everywhere in the countryside, which of course are great, that people are, are you know, moving into smaller communities to take care of each other and, and uh, grow natural foods. And uh, the United Nations issued uh, a, a paper almost a decade ago now saying the only way to feed uh, all of the humans in the near, in the future would be through small family farms, through small farms using natural methods to grow food again, the kind of food I grew up on. Uh, and this is encouraging. But the best thing I've seen about cities lately is uh, the concept of anchor institutions. If you look in your city for some Uh, organizational institutions that have infrastructures that are going to stay there, like a hospital, a university, Uh, in Hawaii for the foreseeable future, at least the tourist industry industry is a local industry that's massive and accounts for a big part of the economy. These anchor institutions, if you can convince them to do more local shopping, by investing in the businesses they need as suppliers locally rather than importing all the things they need, especially food. If a hospital, for instance, invests in local farmers, you, your patients will be eating healthier food, right? And the same with a university. If, they, if it invests in local energy systems, then it will save a lot of energy because that will become cheaper than importing the energy from outside. Uh, For instance, in our islands, which are the most remote islands in the world, uh, you have to cross more water to get here than anywhere else. And we, we import most of our fuel and food, which is crazy because we could easily make our our energy from solar and wind and, and water waves and stuff like that. Uh, and we could easily grow enough food. Uh, in before the white man came to the Hawaiian Islands, they there was a population as big as today, and they were feeding themselves. Right now, we can have even much greater variety. They lived on you know half a dozen local foods, <laughs> maybe well maybe more than that because they ate so many different species of wild foods. Uh, but we we can grow almost anything here that you can grow in other places in the world. So we could become food self-sufficient again. And I love the idea that you work with these anchor institutions that exist already and that we need. We don't want our universities to fold, particularly. We don't want our hospitals to fold. Uh, so instead of, of talking to Costco and Walmart, which are the drain institutions, Everything you earn here in Hawaii, if you shop at Costco or Walmart, that money goes off island. So what you want to do is keep money circulating within your own economy, right? And and so I love that concept. It comes uh, at least in part from the Democracy Collaborative. If you look up the Democracy Collaborative, you'll see a lot of solutions that they are coming up with, including this concept that's recent to me of anchor institutions mm, thank you for that we are, we are getting close to to our time 
and I was I was thinking like so on one side we talked about the deep history of life in the planet and how that kind of indicates us that we might be in a close to a major shift for human species towards maturity collaborative maturity stage and so i wonder like if we look at these days you already start to mention some things that so there's obviously in, in all sorts of of human systems there are signs of collapse and of of uh, limits uh, that, that those systems are are meeting uh, that prevent them from continuing this idea of you know uh, exponential growth and those kind of of very um, ideas very detached from the way nature works. So I'm wonder like where do you see what what other things are you seeing that are um, that are kind of um, or let, let's put it in another way. So in this summit, we, we, we are exploring conflicts and particularly how our habitual responses to conflicts in, in, within us, in between humans and between groups in society, how the, ways, the habitual ways we have been uh, addressing the, those difficult situations and responding keep us trapped in producing outcomes, outcomes that nobody wants, so that's a dynamic that is like really omnipresent all over the world and we see in many places of social change being uh, you know uh, hostages of those kind of uh, of, of dynamics that then yeah. uh, make energy uh, dissipate so what hints from your reflections from your journey of, of looking into life in a very deep way what insights can you share with us uh, that could help people start that path towards a mature collaborative uh, environment that we could start each one of us in our own place to bring this to life instead of waiting for institutions yeah. and top-down responses that obviously are not going to come because these places in center of powers are way too detached from the margins and the rest of of the, of the system system that is that is giving signs of, of collapse mm -hmm. so yeah i'm really curious okay. well uh you you just uh hinted at it you know uh it's not going to be a top-down revolution it's going to be bottom up it's going to be starting with each one of us and of course one of the most important things happening in the world today is massive massive consciousness awakening uh, so that we are seeing people are hungry for the collaboration, for the cooperation, for not necessarily looking at capitalism versus communism, but as one as a Catholic priest in Spain started uh, a half a century ago in, in the Mondragon region, uh, which I think you know about, and for the Mondragon cooperatives, he asked a lot of young people, how would you build a, a society and an economy that was neither capitalist nor communist, but based on loving human relationships? And of course, it was very successful. It's an instance of urban cooperatives. On the other hand, for rural cooperation in Sri Lanka, we have the Sarvodia movement uh, that was started by Dr. A.T. Aryaratne a friend of Mohammed Yunus who started micro-lending. And uh, there, the children from very young are taught two principles, just two simple principles, inner peace and generosity. If I am peaceful and I am generous to everyone else, no one will be in want. Right? What can I give? What do I have to offer? And to enjoy giving is fun because you see the reactions and and you get love back when you gift, right? Uh, yeah, but I, I was just wondering. Sorry to interrupt, Elizabeth, but that's that's yeah. a very uh, critical aspect because most people I talk with and people within my closest circles, family, but not only, are. Yeah, they, they already give signs of what you are saying. They long for a different um, future. They want to connect with places that are more um, embedded with love and with 
collaboration, mutual support, but we are still deeply um, embedded or within systems of, as we mentioned in the beginning, that are built on the ideas of scarcity, mm -hmm. competition. So there's this difficult transition that, that people are facing and somehow all of us have one feet on one and trying to start to yeah. put our full selves into another another reality and yeah i wonder what do you think about that because it's really challenging the the collaboration and cooperation is building it just doesn't make the mainstream media as much and also look we're looking so much to indigenous cultures again many indigenous cultures reached that mature phase you see but what we did in the West was when we built these cities, we started competing among the cities and building the age of empires that were first ruled by emperors. And then we had national empires and now we have corporate empires and we're constantly trying to keep people apart. And notice with this new virus, what is the solution? Isolation. Put people back into isolation by themselves. Keep them away from each other. They might collaborate, you know. <laughs> so we th these are obstacles put in our way. And But fortunately, now we at least have our computers. And the internet, the internet, the ability to commune directly with each other is growing as fast as the internet, which is made of computers. The internet are the people that are collaborating and that are beginning to transmit information directly to each other, just the way indigenous peoples did, where everything in nature communes with each other. Our cells, our bodies wouldn't even function if our cells didn't each know what they were doing within a collaborative. So we're learning this, we're, we're reclaiming our birthright to be connected, indelibly connected. We cannot be torn apart. We're learning oneness. We're learning that we're a global family. Uh, you know, we, we're doing this. We're not allowing the separation in the way it used to be allowed. That's great. I was thinking like, I just want to see if, if, if that's what you mean also, because when we think about conflicts, often people look at them as uh, something to avoid because obviously there's all sorts of pain and, and um, difficult feelings that come with meeting a conflict either within us or between people or groups of people in society. So our, our the, the mainstream, like the dominant view is that conflicts is, is something that we, that we can avoid and that we need to avoid at all costs or or and what i'm hearing is like actually nature doesn't produce anything that doesn't have um that doesn't make part of this whole there's nothing that is like uh, yeah. that has no purpose mm -hmm. uh, so yeah so that demands from us a big shift towards thinking like what is this informing us like what is the covid the, the coronavirus informing us and how we can live with it in a way that we transform this relationship what we can do with each other so that difficulties that we meet when we meet each other truly uh, can help us to both transform and move forward is is that is that in line yeah, with what you're trying to... We have to relearn the lessons that the ancient bacteria learned and, <laughs> and realize that, you know, if, if you remember that they built the nucleated cells and we're built, made of the nucleated cells, uh, one scientist uh, actually quipped, maybe the ancient bacteria built us as giant taxis to get around in safely. <laughs> <laughs> and now it's beginning to look as if maybe he's right, that we, we aren't individuals. We are huge collaborators of bacteria and single cells that are working incredibly harmoniously and we long we know that it's our birthright to be this way with each other and so everything you see that resists that that tells you no no you're an individual you're isolated you stop talking about you know for years we couldn't even say the word community because it was related to communism and that was scary yeah. and <laughs> so uh we, I think it's just com it's coming, it's bubbling up in us, and we know it through our ability to meditate, to be, to achieve inner peace in the middle of the turmoil, that we, or to raise our consciousness up high as the Polynesian navigators, uh, who were 
crossing whole oceans and now circumnavigating the globe in little canoes in the middle of huge storms. We have now a perfect storm of crises and we have to navigate. And they looked at all the signs in nature, learn from nature, everything you can. And when all else fails and you can't tell where to go from the patterns of the waves and the seaweed floating and the fish migrations and the clouds over the islands and stuff, raise your consciousness up high, stand tall in your canoe until you see the big picture and then come down peacefully and move toward your goal. Don't bang your head against a wall if things aren't working. Look for the ways in which you can make things work and, and do it. Each individual must do this from a personal calling. If you're called to write songs, to play music, or to uh, write books, or to heal people as a doctor or a nurse, uh, or a health practitioner in the countryside, or if you want to do economics or politics, go into the halls of power and get people out voting. Whatever calls you, do it because you've got to enjoy changing the world yourself in order to become an attractor to other people. And that's how we form these collaboratives and communities by gravitating toward each other, seeing the successes, oh, there's an echo village, I'd like to live there, or here's some urban cooperative that's doing good. It's changing the education system. I want to go there, I want to go there, right? We become attractors for each other, and then we recognize that it's all one system, that we're all connected, and that we should welcome the breakdown of a dysfunctional system. Yes. We have to welcome the breakdown of a dysfunctional system in order to see how we can rebuild from what's still available. Nature, the planet is still there and we can clean up the oceans and we can raise our food in healthy ways again. <laughs> One of the things I was noticing that was also kind of present in different parts of our conversation is, is related with... Um, borders because we mentioned for instance identity and the fact that when there's big transformations in our lives our identity and so we kind of open up there's this movement of opening to what could be mental mental borders or borders in our mental territory of who we are and that we talked about our bodies and obviously our bodies are open systems because we are constantly exchanging with the with the other systems we are embed, deeply embedded in and I was also coming back to the bacteria that where we started that actually there's, I remember when I studied in school, we had this notion of a, of a cell in a bacteria as, as having a very defined wall, a very defined border. But I came to know a bit that that's not the case. So that's okay. one of the, maybe one of the movements that we need to start to open the, a movement of opening that there's the borders we put in our minds and that we think the world is made of are actually much more porous than we, we could ever imagine. Right, right. We have skins and, you know, they are interfaces uh, for collaborating with what's outside us, uh, not, not borders to seal off the outside, but to connect. And we're being told now, you know, we're not even supposed to touch each other anymore. I mean, they must be frantic <laughs> to keep us <laughs> apart because they say that for about an airborne virus. And they tell you that the cheap masks don't do any good anyway. So we're still breathing on each other, but we're not supposed to touch. Uh, <laughs> yes, this is, so we, we, we must build our own inner strength and not, not get hooked into the fear and the isolation that we're told we have to do. Uh, you know, I've never seen these hazmat zoot suits before, except in very toxic warfare or in the laboratories that play with viruses where they wear them. Now, suddenly, they're all out in public everywhere. Ice people isolated in their, in their new cocoons. <laughs> So do, do you want to say some final, any final message for our audience before we finish, Elizabeth? Just stand tall in your canoe until you can see what's going on in your world. Look into things like money systems. Do we have to have a money system that concentrates wealth? We were warned against that one 2,000 years ago. 
by Islam, by Judaism, by Christianity, uh, and we're still doing it. We don't have to. We can reinvent money systems. It isn't even illegal. Uh, so we can do that and enjoy everything you're doing to make a better world. Become an attractor. Love each other. Know that we are all spirits having a wonderful human experience, no matter how bad it looks. Every crisis is nothing but a big opportunity. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. It was a big, deep pleasure to be here with you. And I hope we can uh, continue this conversation in the coming future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Nunu, for having me. Thank you all. Aloha. Aloha. Aloha.